Alright, we're live. We're live. Hello uh, out there. Facebook, sorry for the delay. Having some technical difficulties today. Um, but, praise God, we are here. Um, we want to sing a hymn. Get us going. And uh, I think we're going to sing number 95, Down at the Cross. Down at the Cross. Hallelujah. Down at the Cross. All right. Here we go. Down at the Cross where my Savior Name, precious name, glory 
thank you. We praise you and magnify you. You're worthy of glory and honor and praise. Lord, we know that you are God and not us. Lord, we trust you. We put our confidence in you. We want you, Lord God, to have your way in our lives. We need you, Lord God, to manifest yourself according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, show forth your glory. Lord, we don't want your glory for ourselves. We just want you to be glorified. Lord, that's all we want, Lord, for you to be glorified. Lord, we thank you right now that we are we are satisfied with you and your provision and your the way you take care of us. Lord, you're very faithful. And Lord, we just thank you. Lord, we pray over all the things that concern us today. We pray, Lord God, for the times we're living in and the world that we live in, that, Lord God, you would not allow us to be left alone. We pray right now, Lord God, that you would give us comfort and make us know that you are God and there is none besides you. Lord, we know that you know, Lord God, exactly what we need. There's nothing, Lord God, that you won't provide or give us, Lord, that that uh, that we need. Lord, you said if we needed a fish, Lord, you wouldn't give us a serpent. If we asked for bread, you would not give us a stone. Lord, you will give us any uh, the good gifts, Lord, that we need, Lord, especially your Holy Spirit. And so we pray today that you'll give us your Holy Spirit as we seek the person of Jesus Christ, as we seek salvation through his name, as we seek the Father to know him, Lord, through the Son. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, that you will give us your Holy Spirit because without him, we cannot do it. We cannot reach you. We cannot understand you. We cannot be in relationship with you if you don't first give us that in that down payment of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for that. And we treasure it. We ask you, Lord God, to just have your way in our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, we thank God for this. Uh, I'll speak. Okay. Praise the Lord. Um, <clears throat> We thank God for um, what he's doing in our lives today. Uh, we thank God for um, his grace and mercy. Uh, we've been talking um, for some time now about what it means to be a disciple. We've been talking about what it means to, uh, to be alive in this day and time because this is a very special time. It's a time where God is really um, been showing us that he is God and uh, he is really uh, making it clear to us that without him we can do nothing. Um, we've been this morning in our prayer time looking at a passage that I'll start with in John chapter 5 and um, just set a tone. Last week we looked um, uh, again at uh, John 2 and John 3 we took a moment to look at uh, the well uh, that, that we must dig in order to uh, to really reach the fulfillment of what God wants for our lives that we must understand how to dig a life that seems to the world to be um, isolated and exclusive a life that digs down deep in an area, the area of uh, spiritual growth, the area of life itself, until you reach that life, that water. And uh, so Sunday we took time and we uh, tried to illustrate that. And so you can go back on Facebook and look at that. And if you don't have access to Facebook and you would like a link to that, please just uh, go to our website, send me a message restoresite.org but um, that that is the purpose of that is that we would become aware of what it is God really wants from our lives God wants something from our lives and what he wants from us is spelled out throughout the New Testament um, today we're going to look at Jesus himself as he uh, gives us this indication or this clarity about what it is that uh, that God wants from our lives 
and we'll find it uh, in, in, in uh, John chapter 5, verse 19, and uh, we'll also read verse 30. Um, John 19 says, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son does also in like manner. So we know then that this issue of uh, obeying God is an issue that is uh, about obedience. Um, and the Amplified, that verse 19 says, So Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you, most sol solemnly I tell you, the Son is able to do nothing of himself, of his own accord, but is able to do only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does is what the Son does in the same way, in his turn or in like manner. So uh, this, this tells us then that there's something that uh, the Father requires. Jesus chose that good part. Remember when Jesus was baptized by John, it says the heavens opened and God looked down for our sake and said, this is my son and him I am well pleased. Jesus is the son who pleases the father. He is the one who pleases him. And, and this issue of uh, what is going on here um, in, in John chapter 5 is an issue of Jesus not meeting the standard of men. Men had set standards, and and uh, in verse uh, uh, nine, is it? Yeah, in verse nine. Well, in verse eight, Jesus said to the man at the pool, "Get up and pick up your pallet and walk." Immediately, it says the man became well and picked up his pallet or his mat or his bed and began to walk. It says, now it was the Sabbath day or it was on the Sabbath day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not permissible for you to carry your bed. So, so, so here we see that Jesus is disappointing the very men who thought they were representing him. He's disappointing them because he's, he's healing somebody on the Sabbath because they have taken this issue of the Sabbath and raised it above God himself. And so they, they, they look at Jesus and it says, they uh, said it's not permissible for him to do this. Verse 11 says, but he answered them, he who made me well. Now, this is the guy who got healed. He said, he who made me well. Well, who was the one who made him well? Well, it was Jesus. It was God himself. He says, but he who made me well told me to get up, carry my bed, and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, pick up this pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away. He told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working unto now, and I myself am working. Watch this. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So, so Jesus disappointed them. I'm saying that lightly. He really ticked them off. Because they had, they figured that they had a market cornered on what God wanted. And they had put
put into this practice their own feelings. Remember, we looked at this last week, I think it was. We talked about the soulish realm. Now, the soulish realm is where we uh, engage our world. The soul is the mind, the will, and emotions. Yeah, we looked at this last week. It's still on the board. This is the soul. It's comprised of the mind, the will, and the emotions. It sits inside of a man. The soul is inside of a man. And if you don't have the spirit of God, then what you have is the soul without God. Now, a man with God also has a soul. But you can be a man with a soul, but God may not be in your life. You may not have his spirit. And so a man with the soul without the spirit of God can make up his own mind about even the things that God has written and the things that God has said. The issue of, of our, uh, our day and time is the issue of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the garden, they went against God. Eve heard the serpent, and the serpent said to Eve, uh, let's, let's look at that quickly. I'd I like to flip you just a little bit quickly, and um, this teaching is going to be, you know, I've been, I, you know, once I start looking at stuff, it starts expanding, so I'm going to try not to expand it, let it, you know, I can't, I can't help it, I'm sorry. I'm going to let God do what he do. How about that? So I'm going to take you a little further because every time I touch these passages, God expands my understanding and he begins to speak what he wants to different groups of people. So what he wants to say now uh, will take up from uh, Genesis chapter one and um, excuse me, Genesis chapter three, verse one. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 we're going to look at why it is that these people wanted to kill Jesus and I'm going to show you why it is it says now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made and he said to the woman indeed has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden the woman said to the serpent from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it, nor touch it, or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, uh, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good. Now watch this. Before now, she did not see the tree as good. Her experience with the tree was only that of her understanding that God said, don't touch it. So prior to now, her experience was that the tree was not good. But because of the nature of how we're made, that we respond hearing to see. When she heard something different, she began to see something different. So the enemy knows if he can get your ear, he can turn your head. He can get you to see things the way he sees it. So he starts at a young age with a child. A little baby get in the cookie jar and crumbs all around the mouth and they come to you and you say did you get the cookies and then she's and the child says no well who taught the child to lie we're born in sin and shaped in iniquity and it is because of this conversation that all of these things are so this conversation changed everything because when Eve gave her ear to the serpent and, and began to see things from his perspective, everything began to change. And it began to uh, 
solidify once Adam did. Now, so Eve says that when she looked again at the tree, she saw that it was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. And the tree was desirable to make one wise. She saw something different because of what the serpent told her. And so this is why they wanted to kill Jesus. Because they have been given a bill of goods that said the thing in life that we need to preserve is our place in this world. They didn't understand that what they had in them was an opportunity to be connected with the God of the universe and to live forever in eternity. But they have not heard that out of the message. What they heard was you have something that you should try to preserve for yourself. So they took their position as chief priests and elders and they used it to say, we must preserve. We're going to take care of ourselves. We're not sure if God sent this man and we're not going to go pray to see if God sent this man. We're going to do what we think is best, what we've learned from our experience, what our mind, our will, and our emotions tell us. So their emotions were fear, misunderstanding. And so they, they began to feel uneasy because what they thought was real, Jesus came and he made it so that they knew that what they thought was real wasn't real. And it happens to us. Life happens to us and things, things that we thought we were secure in Sometimes even our faith, some of us have been challenged in our faith as we've gone out further into the world. You know, my baby girl's about to go to college, and I can tell you, I don't know if she's going to eat good lunch at the lunchroom, but I guarantee you her faith's going to be challenged. I don't know if she'll have a good roommate, but I can guarantee you her faith will be challenged. Because when you go out into the world, they have a perspective on things. And by the time they get through talking, you say, man, that thing is desirable. It's good. Mm. What have I been thinking? What have I been missing? So your child come home and you see something different about it. Because they have been engaged at the soul level. The only thing that can, can remedy that is if we embrace the spiritual life. So God says, from now on, everything now comes first natural. You have to choose the spiritual. Because only those who choose it will embrace it. He gave it to Adam and Eve to see what they would do, and they threw it away. Now, every person, they get to come in believing what the devil believes. That I have the knowledge of good and evil. I know right from wrong. And we get to choose what we're going to see Jesus choose in just a second. We get to choose to believe God. So Adam and Eve, they were given this opportunity. Let me see. There may be something else I need to read out of this. Let me just finish reading this so that we don't have to come back. Because I want you to, I want, I want to really pull out of this John 5. It says, the serpent told the woman, you won't die. This is from the message. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you'll see what's really going on. You'll, you'll be just like God, knowing everything, ranging all the way from good to evil. See, prior to this, what did they know? They knew what? Good. It's possible to know good without evil. But once corruption comes in, you now know evil. And now there's always going to be what? A choice. A thing that's bad for you, you look at it and you say, it's good, it's desirable. And you put your trust in things based on how you feel and not based on what God says. It says, immediately the two, of, I mean, then when the woman saw that the tree looked like good eating and realized that she would get what she would get out of it, she know everything. She took and ate the fruit and gave some to her husband and he ate. And immediately the two of them 
did see what's really going on. <laughs> I love the message Bible sometimes. It said immediately they did see what's really going on. <laughs> they saw themselves. See, they never saw themselves before. There was no self for them to see before. There was only them and God, one unified creation. They were one with God. There was no, there was no delineation. They were one with him. Whatever he said, we said. Whatever, whatever I do, he do. Whatever he do, we do. They were just with him. They thought with him. He thought with them. But immediately when they ate, they saw themselves separate from God, which, which is the death that occurred. He, they became separate from God. And when they saw themselves separate from God, they began to think, man, my breath stinks. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? They ain't never had a thought separate. You know, prior to that, the, the thought was, Hey, let's go brush our teeth. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Now the thought is your breath stay. <laughs> uh, to make y'all laugh, I know I'm taking y'all to some hard places. But guess what? The issue is that this thing was very serious. It says immediately the two of them did see what's really going on, saw themselves naked. They sewed fig leaves together to make shift clothes for themselves. When they heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees. God called to the man, where are you? He said, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. There was no I mentioned before now. All of a sudden, there's I and she. Separation from God, separation from each other. When the, when the serpent asked Eve about eating the fruit in the beginning, she said, we, we know. There was no separation between her and her husband and no separation between her and God. But now there's I and the woman and she and he. And those things are now the thing that drive between us as um uh, Men and women of God. As men and women of God, those are the things that separate us. So we have to be aware that God is, is trying to get us to see something. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. I could keep going. Let's go back. John 5. Now, so why were the Jews trying to kill Jesus? The Jews were trying to kill Jesus because they did not understand. They had been sold a bill of goods that what they had and what they were doing was, was God's great purpose. They had made an arrangement with the world. The Jews of that day had an arrangement with with, with uh with the Romans. The Romans allowed them to, to do their religious thing. They backed the Romans up. They made sure the people didn't get didn't rebel and all of that. We kept rebellion down. And the, and the Romans said, look, as long as y'all keep down all that foolishness, everything can run as it is. They had an arrangement with the Romans, but and, and they thought they also could have an arrangement with God. And that the arrangement they had with the Romans wouldn't get in the way of the arrangement with God. But see, it don't work like that. So when Jesus came, what arrangement did they choose? They chose the arrangement they had with the, with the Romans. They chose the arrangement that they had with the world. But these are the religious leaders of the day. And they only follow God as it relates to rules, they don't have a heart or discernment to know the will of the Lord. So they say to Jesus, who is the Sabbath, <laughs> he is the Sabbath. They say to him, we 
we're going to kill you because you broke the Sabbath. Huh. And you you putting too much attention on yourself. We're going to kill you. That's out of control. You think? But this is coming from a soulish leadership, soulish realm of a man that they their mind has been trained through experience in the world. Their will is set to whatever a man has set their will to. So as even though they're priests and, and scribes and, and, and so on, somebody has set their will to say, I will be successful. I will be wealthy. I will be prominent. I will be respected. I will be in charge. See, see this is the will of man. But here comes Jesus, who has all authority, and let's see what he says about it. Because what they did was they took their will and they applied it to making sure that they could have the things that they wanted, to be in charge, to be respected, to be able to tell people no, to be able to control people. I will control this church. I will control the people. And, and so here it is. Here's Jesus with all this power and authority. Let's look at what it says in the, in the message. It says, but Jesus defended himself. He says, my father is working straight through even on the Sabbath. So am I. That really set them off. The Jews were not only out to expose him, they were out to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling his God, his own father, putting himself on a level with God. So Jesus explained himself at length. This is the message. I'm telling you this straight. The son can't independently do a thing, only what he sees the father doing. What the father does, the son does. What the father loves, the son, excuse me, excuse me, the father loves the son and includes him in everything he is doing. But you haven't seen the half of it yet, for in the same way that the father raises the dead and creates life, so does the son. The son gives life to anyone he chooses. Neither he nor the father shuts anyone out. So this, this, this whole thing begins to show us that there's an obedience that Jesus walks in that we don't know anything about. Everything for us is a choice. I choose what church I go to. I choose what job I want to have. I choose who I'm going to be in relationship with. I choose who I'm going to forgive. I choose who I'm going to hold accountable. I choose everything for myself because I have the knowledge of good and evil. And so this issue of that Adam and Eve began in the garden by eating that fruit, it, it, it has come all the way down to every generation. And in our generation, we see it more prominent than ever that men feel like they have the right to choose. Do you know, we hear this stuff about, uh, about uh, abortion, the right to choose. It's the woman's right to choose. See, so we feel like we know how to make a right choice. But Jesus didn't think so. Jesus said, uh, let me read it, verse 19 from the New American Standard, and I'll read it from the Amplified. It says, therefore, Jesus answered and was saying to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son does also in like manner. And the Amplified, it says, So Jesus answered them by saying, I assure you, most solemnly, I tell you, the son is able to do nothing of himself of his own accord, but he's able to do only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does is what the son does in the same way in his turn. So, so, so the, the son says, I 
can only do what I see the Father doing. He doesn't say, I do what I see my Father doing. He says, I only do what I see my Father doing. So, so there's, a, there's, there's something to, for us to, uh, to understand of this. There's something that we must understand from what he's doing. That if we don't get this particular thing, then we won't understand what we spent last week seeing. That, ju that Jesus didn't commit himself to others because he knew what was in them. See, the nature of the flesh that came into man during that falling away in the garden that nature cannot please God. The reason being is because that nature will always oppose what God wants. It is, it is that nature that believes that it knows best. It is that human nature that thinks that it can choose right from wrong. There have been many times in my life where I would have discounted someone. I would have not been in relationship with someone. But God said yes. My flesh said no. And some of those individuals I've seen God just take their lives and build them up and do exceeding great things. There are other people who I thought were going to really be a blessing to my life. I, count, I put all my eggs into that basket and all my eggs got crushed up. <laughs> I didn't even get an omelet or a scrambled egg out of the deal. Because I thought I could judge right from wrong. There are things that I did that in my mind it was right for me to do. But in hindsight, I would never do it again in my life. See, I know y'all can attest to what I'm saying. But see, this is what is at stake here, it sounds very constricting, like Jesus is saying, man, you, 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 you lose, you, you feel like when you hear him say, I only do what the Father does, it sounds like, ah, I'm going to lose my life. I mean, what, what will my life be if I can't make choices? If I can't make my own choices, I don't want to live. I, I get it. But only after you have made enough bad choices and hopefully live through them, can you come to this conclusion? Only once you have seen the value of giving your life to Christ. Can you make this, can come to this conclusion that I only do what I see him doing? I let him be the judge and the jury. I trust him that much. And so this message of, of being born again has to do with getting into you a nature that can be uh, obedient and can be uh, workable in the plan of God. When we have our old nature, that nature will not allow us to bend into the will of God. Our own will is strong. And God will not force you to change it. He will only invite you to line your will up with his. He will only instruct you and teach you. Now, there's a lot here, but for the conservation of time, I'm going to skip to, to verse 30. And, uh, and read from there. Verse 30 says, uh, Jesus says, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I'm taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide. As a voice comes to me, so I give a decision. 
and my judgment is right, just, righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. So, so, so the character of Jesus is shown here in this 30th verse, especially in the Amplified, which, which amplifies what he says, that he is very much aware of how tight it sounds. But he wants us to know that the difference in this Adam, which he is, and the first Adam is that the first Adam chose his own way. Chose his own way. He rejected God being his source of understanding. He rejected that God would be the one telling him everything to do. He rejected that and he found another way. That way involved him uh, eating of that fruit and then being kicked out of the garden and having to live by the sweat of his brow. That way led to Genesis chapter 6 where God destroyed the whole earth because everything in their mind was evil continually. This is the result of man choosing his own way. God was able to save one man, Noah, and start again. But even then, he had to implement a new plan through which he would bring a nation. He would show that nation his will, his purpose. He would choose a nation of people led by some men of obedience at times and seasons who would keep that nation moving toward his will so that he can show what happens to a people who follow his will. He had to reteach all of humanity and he used the Jews to do it. Some people feel like, okay, why the Jews, why God choose them and this and that and we get into ethnic things and color and all that when it really has nothing to do with that. God chose him a man from which he started a family and that family he used to build a nation who he called his own. That nation he put under sanctions and laws at a point in time. And he caused them to try to be like him by using the law. And now we still think that we could be like him according to the law. But the reason why he sent his son was because we could not. We cannot be like him by keeping the law. He sent his son because all of that was only causing us to be struggling. And so he said, for those who struggle and those whose heart is sincerely after mine, I'm going to put them away in a place in the earth called Abraham's bosom. Until such a time as I can get my son to them for deliverance. Because without the shedding of blood, there'll be no remission of sin. And without them following my way, there will be no salvation and no heavenly rest. So Jesus had to come and not only die, but he had to live to show us that you can do what this right here. He says, <clears throat> I am able to do nothing from myself. So if the Satan had to come to Jesus, and he was the one in that garden. And he said, well, why don't you eat of this fruit? It'll make you wise. You know what Jesus would have said? I am able to do nothing of myself. Do you see what I'm saying now? If he had said that, then the whole thing would have stopped. Even if Eve had ate it, as long as Adam didn't do it, because he was the one holding all the seed, he was the one who God had in charge, as long as he didn't do it, there would have been, a, been hope for reconciliation, for us to stay in relationship with the Father. But guess what? Adam didn't do this. 
But Jesus said, if Satan were to come to me, this is what I would tell him. I am able to do nothing from myself, independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. So, so the issue of discipleship is the issue of not thinking that you have something to bargain with, with God, but opening yourself up and say, God, dig as deep down and remove whatever you've got to remove until the flow of water flows. I don't want to know what's all out there. I don't need to investigate all out there. I know what the issue is. It's down deep inside. Dig down, Lord, and remove out that old nature, every part, until the water flows flows, till your life flows. You know, we sing that song, turn my heart, O oh Lord, like rivers of water. Turn my heart, O oh Lord, by your hand, till my whole life flows in the river of your spirit, and my name brings honor to the Lamb. It is in that digging that he removes all of that, and we now have this fresh flow of life. He says, I can only do this as I am taught by God and I get his orders. So the issue of disciple, what is discipleship? It is being taught of God and getting his orders for your life. It means sitting down, digging in that one spot till depth comes and the water flows. Getting understanding. Not continuing to dig all around everywhere, trying to get some here, some there, some there. I've done all that. I've been in all these crusades and all these camp meetings and all these different things and classes and most stuff. And I realize that it is in the digging down. But see, when we dig down, we get into that hard place. We get into that place where the shovel gets stuck in the muck and mire of our life. And then we want to stop digging. We get discouraged. We get tired. And so then we say, well, let's try to dig over there. <laughs> and we dig down a little depth. And then we dig over there. Then we look and we say, well, we got a pretty good sized hole. If it rains, we can fill it up. So we're praying God for rain. Oh, Lord, let the rain come. And so he will rain. He said he rained on the just and the unjust. Externally, God will fill up so that people can come and get something. And so now we start a ministry. We got a, we got a, we got the, we got the foot wash. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. We done dug a hole in the ground and we done started the foot wash. But guess what happens to the foot wash? You know, they said the foot wash used to be a holy thing. Mm -hmm. But you know what it became? A muddy pool, a cesspool, contaminated. Now they go down there and they sell weed and dope and everything else and all kind of fusion is going on because you can't dig a shallow thing and think that it's going to stay clear and, and, and stay pure. It's not going to happen. It only, it's only when we get down to where God himself is the one flowing and there's nothing hindering him. So Jesus says, this is how that happens for me. This is the way I, I, I know that I'm flowing with God. I'm able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I'm taught by God and as I get his orders, even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I'm bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. Now, so, so Jesus says, this is how it works for me. When I get into a situation, I'm listening for God. Folk be looking at me, Pastor, you all right? I say, I'm listening. Oh, okay. They don't know what I'm talking about. Because... Because you already know what you're going to do. I say, hey, can you come up here Saturday? Oh, no, I can't come Saturday because nah, nah. you ain't praying. You ain't ask God. What, you didn't take one second to see if the Lord wants to change your plan. You already got your plan made up. And it blows my mind. These are folks who say they believe in Jesus and I've given him my life. All honor to God and all that. And when I ask you a question, you, have, you don't take one second to consult him. You already got your mind made up. Oh, no, I can't do that. How do you know? Because I'm tired. Well, I guarantee you, if, it, if, if, if I was able to 
to say what yes and no to God because I'm tired when well, none of this be going on that's going on here now. That's all folks tell me all day. Pastor, you look tired. I am tired, but that don't mean I get to sit down. And so I'm not, and, and so don't mean that don't mean try to do what I'm doing. I'm saying you gotta hear God for yourself. He says, as I hear the voice, I make my decision. So you can't make no decision until you hear his voice. So Eric, when you're talking to me and you see me pause, it's because I'm listening. I don't know if I can do what you're asking me to do. And then the other part of that is this human thing where people, they, they get upset because you don't, can't give them an answer right then. They want an answer right then. And if you don't give them one, and you don't give them an answer that they want, then they feel like you're doing them wrong. I'm not my own. We sing that song. My life is not my own. To you, I belong. I give myself, <laughs> I give myself to you. It's a joke. But we need to be serious because Jesus says, this is the way I live my life. He says, one more time, he says, Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And watch this. When I do it that way, he says, my judgment is right. It's right. It's just. He says, as I do this, my judgment is right just and righteous because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself. My own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. It is, it is, it is imperative for us that we understand how to please God. I want to, to do what's according to his good pleasure. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For those who come to him must believe that he is. And that he is a reward of them who diligently seek him. See, in order for us to believe that God is, I have to see value in him. I have to place value. See, and the thing is, we place value in things a lot of times sight unseen. We order stuff off the internet, give a good portion of our check to order something off the internet. We've never seen it before. We believe in the preachers that we see on the TV. We believe in the folks who tell you to invest your money in this or that. We believe in a company and go to work for them. And sometimes people have gone to work for a company. I've done it. I've worked for a company before, worked uh, two, three weeks, and they keep promising me and never got paid. But we put our trust in those things. But the question remains, do you trust God? And you don't have to. But if you say you're his, but yet you don't trust him, we have a big dilemma. A very big dilemma because it's a requirement of a steward that it be found faithful. We want God to bless us with all these things, all these blessings, money and fame and fortune and things. And we want him to bless, but you are only a steward. When God give it to you, you become a steward of the blessing. And he may come and ask you to give it to somebody else. He may come and ask you to invest it and multiply it. But we'll take it and hold it. We'll take it and hoard it. We'll take it and waste it. But you, you're a steward. And a steward must be found faithful. You must really see value in the one who placed you in stewardship. We got to get beyond all of these things that we put our trust in. And put our trust in God. Jesus did this. He said all. 
Excuse me. He said, I'm able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I'm taught by God and as I get his orders. I like that. That's the kind of people we want working for us. You hire somebody to come out and work on your house, work in your yard. You don't want them going and cutting your bush down just because they think it don't, they don't like it. You want them to do only, right, what you tell them to do. So it's not that God is being hard. It's that he understands the nature of things better than we do. And we have to be aware of our responsibility to him. Um, John 17. Jesus is speaking about um, the, the uh, authority that has been given unto him. We see that in John 17. We see it in Matthew 28 and 18. But in John 17, Jesus says, it says, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. He says, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work in which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus came and he completed the work that he was given to do. He was able to say that because of that, God released to him authority above everybody else. Authority that he can now give life to you and I. When we have life, we also have authority. We also have power. We also have a favor and status with God. And what he is offering us is the same life that he lived himself. The purpose of him coming was not to show us a life and then give us a different life, but to show us the life that he wanted to give us. Amen? So the purpose of Jesus coming was to give you a, a, a bird's eye view of the life that he wants to give us. And so he lived the life out. It was a life of obedience, but it was a life of power. It was a life of, of exclusivity, but it was a life that touched the whole world. It was a life that, that uh, uh, he spilled out for others, but he also kept it. Because he said, if you try to hold on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll keep it. And so it's a life that makes no sense to the world. Jesus gave his life away and then received more life than he had before. He received all of us. So the things that the, that the Bible teaches are foolishness to men in this world. And if you have put your trust in the things of this world, then you're going to be sad. You're going to be killing Jesus' work, thinking that you're building it up. You've got to be mindful that you have to decide who it is that you're following. Are you following the ways of men or are you following the Christ? It's very, very vital because if we're following him, then he's going to put you on a path to doing stuff that folk ain't going to understand. And it's not going to necessarily be valuable until folk back get against the wall. But in the process of time, you will find that following him will place you in a, in, a, in, a, in a place of understanding your surroundings. Because he says, if we had read all of John 5, I, I, my, 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 my desire for you is go back and read John 5 in its entirety. Because it talks about the benefits when, he, when it says in, chapter, in verse 19 that he only did what he saw his father do. In the next verses, it began to tell you the benefits that came because he did that. It said that he now was able to know everything that the father knew. 
It says also he was able to raise the dead as the Father could raise the dead. It says also that he was given life eternal and could give it to whom he will. And that he even had life that existed within itself. And so all of these were the benefits of his obedience. And so if those are the benefits of his obedience, what will be the benefits of your obedience to Christ? Will there be any less? I don't think so. I think that if we would give him our life, he's telling us that this obedience pays off and it will put you in a position to do things so great and wonderful. But what you, what you can do if you don't want to do it, you don't want to trust him, you can, you can allow yourself to live out this soulish life. This life of the soul led by your mind, your will, and your emotions, which can only record the mind, the will, the emotions. They do not create life. They do not create wisdom. They only can contain life and wisdom as received into you. So as you go through life, you're obtaining or, or picking up ideas and thoughts and experiences, and they're going to populate your mind. They're going to set your will, and they're going to be affected by your emotions. So if in your life you've been shown uh, violence in your mind, you begin to think that life is about violence, and that violence is the only way to be able to survive. So then you set your will to do what? Survive. So then you're going to become the most violent person there is. And what's going to trigger you to make those decisions? Your emotions. So if somebody makes you nervous, you may kill them. If somebody makes you upset or breaks your heart, you may kill them. And so here we saw that these Jews, their mind had been shaped by the oppression that they had been under, and they had put their hearts to survival. And they said, we're going we're gonna to make sure that we keep everything in line. So nobody make a move. Nobody do nothing. You can't do nothing on the Sabbath. God never told you you can't do nothing on the Sabbath. He said to keep it holy. So that means that choose a time and make it holy and spend time with me so I can replenish you. A time where you put your trust in me. So for me, the Sabbath is a day when I don't go out and try to make anything for myself. It's a day when I put my trust in God. And over the years, people tried to make me work on my Sabbath. They tried to tell me when I was in construction, we're going to cancel your contract. We're going to sue you. We're going to do all this. And I said, well, I wake up sometimes at night, I'm thinking, I don't know what I'm going to do. In the morning, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay and go to church. I ain't worried about that. And when Monday comes, I never hear nothing else about it. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, it's just pressure from the world. But my Sabbath is how God shows me his strength. So if God is showing me strength on the Sabbath to show me that I don't have to go out and work, guess what he's doing on the Sabbath? He's working. <laughs> if, I, if, if, if on the Sabbath God is securing me and taking care of me, that means God is working on the Sabbath. See? That's what Jesus said. He said, my father works unto now, and I work. But we try to use human wisdom, and we like rules so that we can govern over folk. But this is the issue of the mind, the will, the emotion. It is not the issue of the heart, the spirit of God that has wisdom that will show you that the purpose of the Sabbath is for man to rest and to put his trust in God. It's not, for, it's not to put the man in jail. It's so that God can be glorified. So that he can know that I got him. So man rested. And God, it said God rested on the seventh day. But guess what? God is still in control. Every day of the week. So the mind, the will, and the emotions, they will trick you into thinking that you are in relationship with God. And so here you are with your life, and you set your life up, and here you are with your soul, yourself, in the center, and you got God in your life somewhere out here. Where is he? Maybe he's out here. But he's not in the center of your life. He's not the source of your power. 
But Jesus says, he is the source of my power, not me. I'm not the source. God is the source. And so Jesus said, I do nothing of my own self because God is the source of my power. I can't do nothing of myself because I move myself out of the center of my life. That's what he was saying to Nicodemus. That's what he was saying in, uh, in John chapter 2 and 3. He says he didn't commit himself to any of those men in John 2.24. Four, he didn't commit himself to any of those men because he knew in, in 225 what was in them. And then Nicodemus comes to ask him about it. And he said, you must be born again. There has to be a transformation that takes place so that you can begin to live your life the way Jesus lived his life. He lived a life where God was the center of his power. He's the source of all things. Everything that Jesus did emanated from God. Everything. His family how he, how he dealt with his family, it emanated from God. How he did with his job, it emanated from God. How he dealt with his community, it emanated from God. How can I be here and deal with people who, who try to trick you, try to do this, you're dealing with church, you're dealing with all kinds of people, folks overlook you, people act like you act like they don't realize that you need have needs. You got all this stuff going on. How could I possibly do what I do? Unless God is the source of everything. When he's the source of everything, I don't get so far out here and run out. That's why people can't, they can't do this. They can't come and help with a community because they ran out. Because everything they're doing is coming from them. And so they're like, shoot, I'm tired. The reason why you're tired is because you haven't uh, let him dig down and remove you out the way and bring that water because the water has a life of its own. He said you will never thirst again. You can pour out continually life unto others, but you can't do it when you're selfish because selfishness only consumes. The power of God, it goes forth and it produces. So if you're going to be somebody that's going to walk with him, he says, I'm not going to even waste my time committing myself to you, even though you say you want to commit yourself to me because you have nothing in you to carry what I need you to carry. You must be born again. You must be born again. You must allow me to remove that old nature. And I'm here to tell you, I'm, I'm done, I'm here to tell you that if you allow him to do it, your life is not going to be boring. Your life is not going to be bad. Your life is not going to be whatever. Now, are you going to have to say no to some foolishness? Yes. But you should do that anyway. If you are willing to give him your... He will begin to give you so much beauty in your life that you will forget all about the darkness you lived for. You used to live for darkness, but now I live for the light. I used to come in, be looking for something to entertain my flesh. Jesus says, you've given all of these folk to me. And gave me authority over them that I might give eternal life to whom I will. This is eternal life that they may know you. I live now a life that desires to know him more and more. Some people say, why do I go so long? I, I, I know him so well. I can talk about him for hours. I'm not talking to you. I'm not giving you. I didn't go home. I didn't go home last night and study for this. She can tell you we was up last night at what, 1230, doing some paperwork. I got up this morning and taught on another line. Loaded some trucks and did all that and then came in here. Because I'm talking to you about knowing him. I'm not talking to you about something I studied so I can show y'all. If you give him your life, it'll be like a fountain. This is what he wants. It's got to be a Because if it's not a fountain then it's going to at some point dry. It's going to at some point become tainted. 
Questions, comments? When men and water is Jesus himself. And uh, recently, you know, I've been living a life where I've been addicted to stuff. And recently, the Lord has been speaking to me about coming out of my addiction. Amen. You know, so that's where I'm at in my place. And what he's what he asking me is, what do I want more, that addiction or Jesus Christ? Yeah. So, yeah. of course, who I am, I'm going to choose Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's not going to be easy to come away from those addictions. Yes. But I have to strive for that. I have to seek that. Amen. You know, seek more and more of Jesus Christ, his life, yeah. to be more like him. Amen. You know, to develop myself. In righteousness, which he provides. Amen. Amen. Um, I hear sister saying, I don't know if y'all can hear her. She says that that water that, that wants to flow is Jesus Christ's life himself. And she said in her life, there have been some addictions that was in the way of that flow. And, you know, as she looked at the, at the, at the, um, the well, digging the well of her life. She looked at the layers, and she began to see that that there's some layers where that's got to be some some evacuation, some removal of some things if that water's gonna flow. See, that's that's where we gotta get to. We've gotta be able to see it ourselves. It's not good enough for nobody else to see it. Cause some of those things, see, see, if I was to look at you, I would say you were probably the least person I would think would use the word addiction, right? You know, now your addiction may be pecan pie. I don't know. But if it's in the way, right? Mm -hmm. If it's in the way of God doing what he want to do, then you got to let it go. Because it's not a spiritual thing that's blocking you. The, you know, it is a, a, a issue within the mind, the will, and the emotions, the soul. Because Jesus can remove, he can remove, he did it already at the cross. Romans 6 says, we know that our old armor new self died with him. If I believe with him, my old armor new self died with him. But it's just like the woman who had been beaten her whole life and her husband is dead. She still won't go do certain things. She just, she just scared. She still won't drive. She still won't do this. She still won't date nobody. Still won't do, because even though a thing can be gone mentally, if we haven't been transformed by the renewing of our mind in that area, you still feel attached to that thing. There's, there was, there's a, there's a uh, addictions. Re the reason we have addictions because we have a, a, we feel there's a need for that thing. That thing has value. It's bringing me comfort. It's bringing me something. And that something, this is the issue. That something that is bringing you is the thing that Jesus wants to bring you. When I talk to people about smoking, right, I try to get them to understand that it's not that smoking is like a, the worst thing in the world. But the comfort that you're getting from smoking, you should be getting it from Christ. So if you refuse to let him have that area, then you're stopping up the flow of the water. That's just one simple thing. And so the smoking, like, you know, they think, well, a lot of people smoke. I know preachers that smoke. I got you. But all them folk are blocking the water. Don't block the water. It's important. You see it. See, see this, is when, this is when it should get serious. When you see somebody in your family who need to be, they need to be baptized in it. You understand what I'm saying? They need to be baptized in the life of Jesus, but you only got a triple because your, your addictions and things are stopping the flow. That's when it should come to the point where you say, I'm, I'm throwing these things off. They, I'm, 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 I'm not going to hold back any longer. I'm letting Jesus have my life. Whatever I see the Father doing, that's what I'm going to do. 
not that difficult. It's not that difficult. I wish I would like to know. I wish I could just take a poll of the people that have grown with me to ask them whether or not I'm such a different person. I know I'm different. There's certain things I don't do. But I wonder, am I such a different person now that I that I'm let, I let them have my life? I don't think so. I don't think I'm any less likable. Now, if your thing is some darkness, of course you ain't going to want to be around me. But I never really hung around people who was that dark anyway. You understand? So what am I saying? Why am I talking about myself? I'm saying that because I pray that this helps. I pray that somebody will take a step out of the boat and get out on the water. Because this issue is not about being in the boat with Jesus. It's about getting out on the water. Because in the boat, you can look like you're with him. But I know Peter was with him because when he said, bid me come to you, Jesus said, come. He jumped out there. And when Jesus chose somebody to speak for him, even though Peter had denied him, who did he pick? He picked Peter because Peter was the one that was willing to show that he's with him no matter what. And I'm saying, how long will we sit back and want to be that one and be letting stuff get in the way? You got me fired up. Questions, comments. <laughs> Zoom people, Facebook people, questions, comments. Questions, comments. Am I trying to turn the mic on? You didn't move there, Batman. Okay. I'm listening. I think it's always amazing that um, that we can see ourselves. And we know what it is that we need to do. Or we know what it is that we need to give up. Um, I like the term that my teeth use. Addiction. We know what our addictions are. Yeah, we do. Um, the truth of the matter is sometimes we just have not come to grips of how to let go of those addictions. And not even understanding what an addiction is or how addiction is formed or um, just the word addict itself. We think that addiction means that we're hooked on drugs and alcohol and all these other things. And addiction just means not having control over yourself over whatever it is. You yeah. know, yeah. an addiction can be anger. Mm -hmm. An addiction can be eating too much or gluttony or whatever it is. But we all have some type or some form of addiction that we have not allowed God to take. Yeah. Um, we feel as though that we can get rid of the addiction because we see little things and we see stuff like Alcoholic Anonymous and this and that and the other. Those places teach people how to, um, how to keep addiction under wraps.
mm-hmm. versus what God wants us to do. That's right. And over a period of time, over a period of years, we, we do find ourselves right back there trying to control those things. You know, if we'll be honest with ourselves, that's what we do all the time. But it comes a time when we have to give up what we know for what we don't know, like you were saying earlier. Just the the attaining what we don't know. How do we get to what we don't know? How do our desire become what we don't know? Right. Amen. 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 Yeah, it's... Um you know, as you as you said, you said that, you know, we don't really like to say that I have an addiction. You know, one of the things that I've learned is that most of the time people who have addictions but can hide them feel like they don't have a problem. The person that has a problem is the person that can't hide their addiction, right? <laughs> so if I can keep it under wraps, like you said, then I'm good. So what we do is we we start we start this 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 mental ascent that says I'm good. I'm straight. They got a problem. The reason why they got a problem because they stuff then came all out and folk can see it. But I'm good because what I'm doing don't really nobody know, but me and two three more people. And so at the end of the day that. That is a, a, a false reality. And that is one of the most difficult things I think we find in Christendom is that there's a, there's a clique or a coalition of people in Christendom who have made it okay to have certain problems as long as they're not out of control. You can be doing certain things. You know, we all do it. We all go in a nightclub and looking for a man every week. We all go in a nightclub looking for a woman every week. We go to nightclub and drinking and doing all that. We we uh, we 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 mess around with somebody husband. We mess around with somebody wife. But it's all right because you know other folk at church doing it. And so those kind of things um, set the order for how things are. So it was the same way with the Ser- the Pharisees and Sadducees, the scribes. They really had a a set of order that, you know, said, well, it's okay for us to do certain things. And uh, so, you know, my prayer is for you, whether you on Facebook, on Zoom, on the phone, I pray that you will will, uh, go to God and just be honest with him about where you are. And ask him to help you to release all of that to him. And and to the point, like the sister said, to you don't want it anymore. You don't want him to cover it up. You don't want him to not punish you this time. You want him to remove not only it, but the person on the inside who was willing to do that. Who was driving you toward that. I need you, Lord, to finish the job of digging this well by by changing, renewing my mind, transforming my thoughts so that they line up with the person that I am supposed to be in Christ. So, you know, that comes through discipleship. That's why you're here. Me and Sister Dave talk about sitting down and getting in the scriptures, dealing with the hard scriptures that don't talk about you being rich or famous, but talk about you being obedient to the Word of God. Talk about you uh, putting aside all your malice and backbiting. Talks about being uh, in in one with the Spirit. All of the scriptures that we will talk about in discipleship have to do with doing away with the self, mostly. And because that is the issue that we have. That is the only thing that prevents us from being Christ. You can be Christ. You can be Christ. Can't be Jesus. But you can be Christ. Paul said it's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. So you can be Christ. He can be in you, working and living through you the 
same way he was in and working through Jesus, but you have to allow the evacuation. And so, uh, thank you, uh, ladies, for your comments. I know we're over time now. Um, um, yes, you got one more thing? talking about our desire to do anything except grow. <laughs> you know, when we should be studying, calling another sister or, or brother and 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 sharing the word and growing in the word, we will we'll say, nah, I'm going to sit here and play on my phone. And um, those things steal away from your from what you should be having for someone else. So the water that you should be accumulating for someone else and for yourself you're not accumulating it. What you're doing is sitting there wasting time when you should be doing something that causes the flow of water to come. Um, and so thank you. That is very good. Um, you know, time wasters and, you know, that's going to be judged as well. We need to understand that he's going to judge you. He's going to play back your life. And if you sit there and wasted most of your life and hadn't put your time in with him, he's not going to be, um, uh, He's not going to overlook it. And uh, you may make it in, but you're going to smell like smoke. You know. And I don't want to be one to make it in and smell like smoke. Because <laughs> he just pulled me out the fire. I don't want to be that. When I see him, I want him to say, well done. When I look upon him who was pierced for me, who did not hold back anything for me, I don't want to be some lazy Christian who just barely made it in. I want to be able to, for him to say, well done. I want him to, to know that I value him giving his life for me. So, you know, thank you, uh, Sister Jay, that, you know, we need to really take the time to to really evaluate our life. And, um, and, and look at Jesus' example in John 5. Um, he said that he gave all. He was willing to do nothing else but what he saw his father do. And, he, and that brought him joy. And, um, and I can tell you, it brings me joy. It brings me joy to do the things that I believe God wants me to do. Um, yeah, we go to dinner. Sometimes we go watch a movie. But, but my time is concentrated in doing the will of the Father. I know my children sometimes like, oh, my God. <laughs> Just came home from the church and you sit down, open that Bible, and get on a phone call with some old church folk. <laughs> But I promise you, my life is not boring. My life is impactful and effective and fruitful. Uh, some of y'all's life is boring. It really is. <laughs> y'all think y'all y'all getting away. I ain't gonna let them have me in that church all the time. Your life boring. Who are you affecting? Whose life are you really affecting? What is the impact of your life? Who can you say that you impact their life? And their life will never be the same. And they're going to go off and impact other people. Where are your folk that you've impacted? Your life boring. Is your life even, is your life even, uh, let me, let me, your life should be meaningful. It should be, it should, you should be able to see the impact you have had on other people, the positive impact, the kingdom impact, especially if you have been able to lead them to eternal life. Oh my God. And help them to walk in it. You should have at least one person that you can say that you're walking with and that person is now in the kingdom of God and on a different path because of you. At least one. But don't stop at one. Keep it going. And so, but if you spend your time playing uh, uh, Pac-Man 
on the phone. It's like you don't. It's like saying I don't really care about people. You know, and uh, I know we're over time, but 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 I watch movies that's two hours, two and a half hours. If it's a good movie, I'm gonna watch it. So I guess you evaluate whether or not what we're doing right now is good. Don't evaluate it on how long it went. Evaluate it on whether it's good or not. Because at the end of the day, if a movie good, when I see it on there, I was like, y'all, we're gonna be three hours in this movie, Star Wars. It's gonna be in three hours. Ain't nobody saying I don't want to go. <laughs> you know, and so at the end of the day, um, but when we sit there and play on our phone and do other stuff for a long period of time, so I'm saying we've got to get to the point where making an impact. I, 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 you know, especially as we get older, we ought to be curious to know what will he say to me when I see him. What would he say to me? Will he be playing back? This my dis me being disgruntled about what he required of me. Was that is that what he gonna be doing when he when I, when he put, called me up for uh, my day before him? Would he be showing me how disgruntled I was, and complaining, and show me that I didn't complain about anything the world asked of me? You know, or will he show me me being resourceful? You know, would he say, boy, this was important what you did? You went in here and you don't know how important it was when you encourage these people. You don't know how important it was when you went and did this for my kingdom. You don't know how, you, you saw it just as one thing, but you doing that one thing allowed these other things to happen. And now uh, these other folk got saved, these other folk got delivered. You know, we, are you making, are, are, are you available for him to make an impact with your life? That's the question. And so, uh, my, uh, Jesus said, I do nothing independently of myself. Only what I see my father do. He said, I, uh, I listen for the voice and then I make my decision. Is that you today? Are you listening for his voice before you make a decision? Are you asking him his opinion before you decide on things? Are you asking him what, it, and not even really his opinion because really he's the one in charge. It's not really his opinion you're looking for. I really wrong when I even say that. Are you asking him what he wants? You know? And are you giving him an opportunity to respond to you before you make a decision? I pray for you today that you will allow him to, to do just that, to give you his instruction, his wisdom, his plan for your life. I pray that you'll be such an impactful person that Lord God will cause you to, for me to see it myself. For me to take notice. I pray I'll have to take notice of your life. Because of how impactful you are. I pray that others will take notice. And that you will do it to his glory. Give him the glory. And he will repay you openly. Reward you greatly. Your life will be wonderful. He'll take you to great places and before great men. He'll make your life an impact, an important life. Your life will not be boring, I promise you. And I thank you. And I pray for each one of you. I pray for your bodies, that your bodies won't fail you, that even now as you make a decision to be more effective for the kingdom, your body will not begin to betray you. As you uh, begin now to, to deal with some of the addictions and things that are in the way of that flow of water, that your body won't begin to fail you or your mind won't try to fail you. That you won't um, uh, have any hindrances, hindrances to this new work in your life. Pray for you right now that you will uh, be able to respond to everything God has for your life. And we just thank you for all that you are uh, doing and all that God is doing in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, y'all. God bless you. God bless you, Pastor. Love y'all.